So in some recent 308 videos, we've got my AR-10 all put back together and that 308 upper is running well and shooting pretty good. So today I wanna to test out my 6.5 Creedmoor upper. Haven't shot this barrel much at all because back when I built the AR-10, we were having so many problems with 308 barrels that I had pulled out the Creedmoor barrel so I could test two, two 308 barrels at a time. It was a mess, but now we're back to the way it's supposed to be. So today I wanna to get it out, I wanna put some shots through it, I wanna get the gas system tuned and just see if we can get it running. And the bullet I wanna to use to test it today is the 130 grain Burger AR Hybrid OTM Tactical. Now, as you might guess by the name, this is designed to be shot near magazine length, so it's a short bullet with a hybrid ogive. So it is designed for the exact application we're gonna be testing today. I've never shot this bullet, so I'm really interested to see how it does. For powder, I wanna use Vitavori N555. I guess you could still call this a new powder. It was announced right at the beginning of the pandemic. So all hell broke loose across the whole market. So, you know, even though it's been available for almost two years now, it still feels new to me. So this will be my first test with it. So new bullet, new powder. N555 is specifically designed for the Creedmoor. So the Vitavori website has got load data for this exact combination. So load data won't be a problem. I also wanna take this opportunity to use a set of Wilson dies that I bought a while back and, and never really used. This kit has got a bushing type full length sizing die and it's got one of their seating dies that you use with an arbor press. I think my thought at the time whenever I bought those dies was I wanted to do a comparison of this type of seating die with an arbor press versus a standard seating die with a standard press. And maybe we'll get there eventually, but for today I just want to try it out, see how it goes. Wilson does sell a, a VLD seating stem, so I've got that. And I also bought three different neck bushings. So before we talk low data, let's go up close here and let's talk about selecting our bushing. Now I've already got 10 rounds loaded up and ready to go. Now this brass was fired with my standard Hornady full length sizing die that has a you know standard expander ball to set your neck diameter. So what we need to do now is measure around the neck and see what these things read. So there's a 291, a little bit smaller spot there, 290 and a half. This next piece, 290, next piece is the same. Now this brass, the necks on this brass have not been turned, so there's a little bit of variation. So like every once, I'll, every once in a while I'll get a, a high reading like this 291.5. Uh, or there's a spot that's 290. All right, so let's call it 290. I probably should have shown the bushings in case you don't know what we're talking about. So I have three of these bushings and you'll see that one reads 289. There's 288 and that one's 287. Now, if we look at the instructions that came with the Wilson die under bushing size selection, option one, the easiest way to tell what bushing size you need is to measure your loaded rounds at the neck. Then it says we select 3,000 smaller than that. So yeah, that's the basics of it. We take our 290 or 290 and a half or the occasional 291 and we subtract three. Some, some people say two. So if we call this 290, it would obviously be 287 would be the bushing we would select. That's the, yeah, so if we're calling this 290, then they're saying 287. If we wanted to call it 291, then it would be the 288. I think today I'm gonna go with the 288. Hopefully that gives us enough neck tension and it leaves us, you know, one larger and one smaller to test with if we wanna play around with neck tension. So this brass is Starline. So this measurement and this selection is only for this one brand of brass. Another brand may have a, you know, a different neck wall thickness, which will mean you need a different bushing. And that's really the biggest downside when it comes to bushing dies. But if you've reached the point where you're wanting to buy bushing dies, you've probably already got a favorite brand of brass anyway, right? Or maybe you're gonna use whatever brand you feel like, and then you're just gonna neck turn them all to a uniform thickness. All those things have to be thought about when it comes to uh, bushing type sizing dies. So we got our bushing, pull apart the die. So that's what we get. There's our decapping rod. It's got this little knurled lock nut sort of deal, which allows you to adjust the length of your decapping rod. But back to the die here, we just take our bushing and the Ellie Wilson instructions say that the numbers should be up. So like looking at the top of the die, we should be able to read the numbers. I believe it's the reading. Yeah, I think it's the reading where the numbers are supposed to always go down. One reason I've seen for that is, you know, when the when the brass is going up into the die and that upward force 
is being ex exerted. If the numbers on the die are raised up a little bit, it can cause the bushing to tilt a little bit. I don't think that's a problem with these because let me see if I can get it in there. There it went. Trying to make sure I had it all the way down in there. I assume it's because of how tightly the bushings fit down in these dies. Like they go in there very, very tightly. So with very little clearance for the bushing that's sitting in there, I don't know how it could tilt. Maybe I'm overestimating how tight that fit is. All right, let's look at our decapping. Yep, got that a little bit too long, didn't I? Which all of my brass today is decapped and this pin serves no purpose, but I don't want to remove it because I think we need this because that surface right there, that's where contact with our bushing is made. So I'm just gonna screw this in a little bit. That should get it well out of our way. And if I screw this until it bottoms out there again, yeah, there we go. It's not gonna do much good for decapping, but it's out of the way. I need to check the instructions. Yeah, this is what I was looking for. It says you should set the black jam nut slightly above the bushing, say about two thousandths to three thousandths of an inch. Do not set black jam nut with too much pressure on the bushing. Did that make sense? That's the black jam nut they're talking about, I guess. And we don't want it cranked down hard against the bushing. Just We'll just back off of it like just maybe that much get the lock nut close and feel it again okay yeah that seems good so that's it ready to go it's going to be a full length sizing die we can bump our shoulder however we want and we've got our bushing to set that neck diameter just where we want it okay let's talk about load data so the Vitavori website shows a minimum charge of 40.1 and a maximum charge of 44.1. The 10 shots I've already loaded are 43.5 grains at a 2.677 inch overall length, which is Vitavori's listed overall length. So that's a little bit shorter than I was expecting. It seems like they're leaving 120 thousandths of available magazine length just leaving that on the table. So I took a case with a split neck and seated a bullet in it to 2.8 inches, which is our actual magazine length. And it looks like that would be okay. Like I wouldn't want to go any longer. Like I put those little black marks on right about where the bearing surface starts and ends. So you can see on the bottom, I mean, there's 60, 65% contact between the bearing surface and the neck of the case. So we've got room to work longer and obviously we've got room we could work shorter. So despite our magazine restriction, we've got quite a bit of workable range to play with here during load development. If you want to even call it that, I've got one box of these, I've got a hundred of them. So this might make a good test of how far could we get on just a hundred bullets. So yeah, today's test, I want to just shoot across the charge weight range that I'm interested in. And I want to do it with two different primers. The Vitavori load data uses uh, Remington seven and a half primers. So I want to test those. And I also want to test uh, CCI BR4s. So 44.1 is what they listed as max. I want to just go barely above that up to 44.3. And it's two tenths of a, of a grain increments. And I just want to shoot one shot at each charge weight and we'll get some velocity data. So hopefully with feedback about pressure signs we're seeing, plus the velocity graphs that we get at the end will at least get us a, to a point where we can choose a charge weight at the end of this video. So if this video gets us a charge weight, then maybe next video we'll either mess around with neck tension here with our bushing die or start playing around with some of that overall length uh, wiggle room I was just talking about. So that's the plan, 30 shots and 10 of them are already loaded, right? So this is sight it in, adjust the gas, and see if we can shoot a group, and then 20 more shots to explore some charge weights.
Now, one very important thing, it will not surprise me at all if we hit pressure problems or if velocities are much higher than we anticipate. The, the Vitavori site shows max velocity at 2850 or 2851 to be precise, but that's from a 25 and a half inch barrel and we're shooting a little 20 inch barrel. The other big difference that could get us in trouble is this Starline brass when compared to the Lapua brass that they tested with. Starline brass is big and thick and heavy and generally, generally has a little less case capacity than some other brands. So less case capacity, higher pressures for a given charge weight. So we'll have to be on our toes, just keep an eye on brass, pay attention to how the gun's running and do our best. That's about all we can do. So this brass has been cleaned and it's been annealed. So we're ready for sizing. All right, so I've got the die pretty lightly touching the shell holder. And this situation's a little bit weird. I do not need to bump the shoulder on this brass. Most of it was fired in my Thompson Center Compass and the brass already fits in the AR-10. So I'm gonna keep an eye on, on the headspace number, but I don't want it to shrink. But I need to get the die down low enough to make sure that the bushing is getting you know fully on the neck. So it needs to be down, it needs to be close to contact with the shoulder or even making slight contact with the shoulder, but that's about it. Best thing about bushing dies is not having to lube the inside of your neck. Makes it easy to wipe cases off. Yeah, I actually did bump that one three thousandths. So back the die out just a little. Not a huge deal. I'm not gonna freak out too much about it. Yeah, they're coming out about zero. So I backed it off enough to where I'm not bumping it anymore. So I'm actually not gonna to need to trim these because this is a big batch of Starline. I've got 200 pieces of this brass just for the AR-10. So whenever I was picking out my brass, I just went through and picked out 20 that were all the same length. So I think it's 1.912, if I'm remembering correctly. Pretty close. I think 1.920, I looked it up a couple hours ago just to make sure I was remembering correctly. But yeah, they're, they're all well short of max and I've got a bunch that are, are the same length. Good enough for me. Saves me the trouble of trimming today. It's one frustration I've always had with Starline brass is it's often very short and you're at four, five, six firings before it ever stretches enough to where you can kind of uniformly trim everything. I mean, it's nice that you don't have to trim, but it'd be nice to be consistent with your prep right from the beginning. And that makes it tough. So not much going on here, just wiping these off with a little bit of uh, isopropyl alcohol. Then I'll chamfer the case mouth, install a primer, and weigh out the charges. Okay, so I've measured out the charges and I wanna see if I can show you guys the case fill. So the end of the row here is the max charge and then moving on down, You can see it gets much lower, or maybe you can, maybe you can't. Now these have not been settled at all. I think I'm gonna take a minute and try to settle them. This, uh, this Lyman loading block has nice tight spots for each case. So I can kind of get in here and at least just give them a little, just a little settling tap. And it really makes a big difference or at least it can. All right, now if we look at that one. Yeah, so that's significantly lower than the one next to it now. So cool, I'm gonna do just a little bit of that and we'll be ready to seat bullets. Now Vitavori does note on their load data when a load is, is compressed. And this was not listed as compressed. So like I mentioned earlier, just I'm on guard for some dramatic case capacity difference really skewing today's results. All right, so here's our bullet seating die. So let's look at the first uh, two seating stems first. The basics of how this die works is, well, hold on one second. We use an arbor press. Yeah, so this, this dinky little guy is the arbor press. This little base part goes on the bottom. 
you take your round ready to be seated and then you place the die just like that and you'll see that gap there where our seating stem is we just bring the arbor press right down and it's going to squeeze it you can also use a hammer but before we're ready for that we'll go ahead and pull the seating stem out and this is like uh, one of my six PPC videos. We use we use a die like this in those. I was initially pulling this out between every round, and some folks informed me that this fit here between seating stem and the die is extremely tight. So when you're trying to line things up and stuff, you can end up boogering things up. I guess it's best to just leave it in the down position, load everything from the bottom, and then just let it kind of work like that. It's kind of crazy how tight the fit is. Like after you're done seating, if you lift up, lift up the die, sometimes the, the round will stay in there just because of vacuum. So not even much air gets around this guy. But okay, back to our seating stem. I do have two seating stems. I think you can order these with whichever one you want. And I just got them both. Yeah, Bullet Seating Drift VLD 6.5 millimeter. So this one here on the right is the standard one and it's it's not the best fit not a very good fit at all so the vld stems a little bit better it's not perfect but it's not bad so that's the one i'm going to use now we got a set screw here and if we loosen that up if you could see there would be a flathead screw yeah looks just like that down in there this is our course adjustment there it goes. Yeah, so this is going to be our course adjustment right there. And then within the die, we've got micrometer adjustments. Let me back this out, see how much. Oh, there's another set screw. So you can definitely lock these down if you want to. So this die is 50 thousandths per rotation. And looks like we've run out of room there. So I guess that's about what we're looking looking at, which each line seems to represent a rotation, which is uh, 50 thousandths. So it looks like 250 thousandths there. So we're at the top of the adjustment. I'll go ahead and bring it down uh, one, maybe. Or should I go two? I, I don't think it matters. There we go, we'll go two. So that's that. All of our set screws are loose and we're ready to get set up and start adjusting. And this might actually go really easy because we've got loaded ammo to play with. So this is the one I seeded earlier. It's right around that 2.677 target we're after. And the cartridge based ogive measurement should be 2.080 right there. So that's our target. So I'll just put our good round right there set the die on top of it and then now i can screw down that course adjustment until i get to a point where the top is kind of lifting up a little bit there it goes right there you see it i want to go just above it and then we'll lock down the course adjustment looks like i've gone too far so I've moved the course adjustment below our set screw, which means I need to take the actual body down a little bit or quite a lot. Okay, I think that's enough. At least it'll lock down now. And I can do the same thing with the micrometer. There we go. All right, so I think that's gonna be about 10 thousandths long, hopefully. I should have my ammo box up here where I can put finished rounds into it a little bit easier. All right, here we go. Let's see how this first one does. Try and center the die underneath the, the ram there. And that felt okay. What did I say? 2.080. 
Okay, so I am 13 thousandths long. So five, 10. Thirteen, and we'll run it back through. And we are right on the number, 2.080. Okay, first one in the box. Now I'm gonna have to watch it as I get longer, or as I go higher in charge weights because at some point the load will get compressed enough to screw up our number a little bit. Or at least it could. Maybe that won't be such a problem with this style of seating die. I've never really loaded a lot of compressed loads in 6PPC, which is mainly where my experience comes, comes from with this style of die. Perfect. I don't know if I didn't settle that one enough. It felt crunchier already. I'm only on the second row. Or maybe I just didn't lean hard enough into it here at the bottom of the stroke. Yeah, that got us a little bit, but not much. Still about one and a half thousandths long. Let's try this other one at the same charge and we'll see if it gives similar numbers. That one's fine, and that one did not feel as crunchy. Like if I shake the cases, I'm definitely feeling a little bit of powder moving, not much. Just gave this, this one that's being a little bit of a pain, just gave it a shake, and I'll try seating it one more time. I mean, it's not, not off by much, but yeah, just about a thousandth of an inch long. We're good, let's shoot it. So I've made it past the halfway point and still haven't run into any major issues. I had one more round that seated just a little bit crunchy and it was a thousandth and a half long, just like that other one we were just looking at. That was three thousandths long. Yeah, a second seating shortened it down a little bit more down to the last two and I have not touched the adjustments on the seating die and that one makes a little bit of a liar out of me it's two thousandths long I'm gonna go ahead and squeeze it one more time here nope about one and a half thousandths long I am not gonna freak out about that Okay, last one. That one's the same, about one and a half or two thousandths long. Let me give it another squeeze. Yeah, it's the same, one and a half thousandths long. Good enough, I'm not going to worry about chasing that little bit. All right, is that it, are we ready? I think we are. Let's get out to the range. I'm getting crazy wind gusts. Like look, like right now, it's mostly calm. Here in like two seconds, it's gonna be insane. Hopefully I can wait for my spots and uh, manage to dodge the wind. Okay, the gun is an Aero Precision M5E1 setup. This is a ballistic advantage barrel, which they partnership with Aero Precision, so their barrels are the same thing. The scope is a Vortex Viper PST Gen 1, 6 to 24. The target is at 100 yards, and this is the Shot Marker Electronic Target System. I'll be getting velocities with the Lab Radar Chronograph and was able to test it out, make sure I had my alignment right and all of that stuff because I just got done sighting in my 308 upper because tomorrow my deer season comes in. So that went really well. Got it zeroed with just a couple clicks and it was stacking a couple of them right there together. So feeling good about that. All right, 6.5 Creedmoor with our Burger AR Hybrid OTM Tactical. Starting out, just gonna get the scope zeroed and play around a little bit with the gas system. 
So I have the superlative arms adjustable gas assist or gas block on this guy. And these blocks, you can use them in either like a restrictive mode, like a normal gas block or also a bleed off mode. I wanna try and see if I can tune it with the bleed off mode. Seems like I tried this once before whenever I bought my first one of these and it didn't go so well, but it's been so long I can't remember. All right, so this is 43.5 grains. Guess I could this first one here. Let's make sure it fed okay. And eh, took a pretty good little ding there on the O drive of the bullet. No worries, we've definitely seen worse. All right, let's get on paper. Just gonna shoot for the center of the target. All right, so I see the hole on paper. Okay, just eyeballing it there. I need to go chase down that first piece of brass. And that did lock the bolt back. Interesting. We'll set it to bleed off a little bit more, I guess. See, there come the wind gusts. The brass looks fantastic. Yeah, that 43.5 grains is about in the middle of the road as far as our primer testing, powder charge testing goes. So that's a good sign. All right, let's zoom in sharp marker a little bit and see if my adjustment was any good. I'll shoot at this left hand dot. Forgot to make the gas adjustment. Okay, let's see what that does. Yeah, that's pretty close. That velocity was 2676, which seems pretty close. All right, so our first shot for a cider, let's hide it real quick. Let's zoom in here and let's uh, let's shoot a little group. So that also locked the bolt back and I'm just about out of adjustment. But my brass is going to four o'clock, almost five o'clock, you know, ending up behind me. So maybe that means we're pretty close. All right, three more shots. We'll just shoot them in the wind. These are burgers. All right, that's not bad. It's not bad at all. It's like I got a shot marker sensor complaining. Just that one shot though. Huh. The group looks right. It matches what I see in the scope, so we'll just let it go here for a few. See what the statistics look like so far for the first five shots. Yeah, 2686, standard deviation of 8.8, .8, extreme spread of 22. That is very encouraging. I'll tell you what, if we're going to be serious today, then I'm going to, I'm going to try and wait out this wind a little bit. Then we'll just keep this group going. Okay, I give up on the wind. It's died down just a, just a little. Okay, five more shots in this group. Well, it kind of drifted around there on us, didn't it? And there were a couple of them. Trying to stack in there. Let's take out those first four shots and see what the five shot group we just fired amounted to. Yeah, so those five went into 0.79 inches. This is very encouraging. Like, very, very encouraging. So I'm trying to decide how to shoot these velocity rounds you know it just kind of dawned on me this is even more impressive considering the barrel like i'm kind of i'm used to shooting my 308 upper with the krieger barrel that shoots tiny groups all the time so nice to you know nice to see some promising results for this guy all right so let's see this is going to be confusing here's how i want to do it i want to alternate back and forth between the primers so they both get a fair evaluation as far as barrel heat, gun heat, all other variables go. 
So I'll try and make sense of it as I shoot over there on the right hand side, but it might be a little bit, I'm trying to think what I could do on shot marker. I could do a couple of these boxes. Yeah, we'll see how that works. These little blue boxes in the top left corner will fill out with the group sizes I shoot, but might be pretty much impossible to see. You know, and I think the easiest way to do these without getting confused will be just to single load them. Yep, that's the plan. I want to single load each one. Okay, so this is just crazy. Both primers shot the exact same velocity for both of those charge, for each of those charge weights. That was the first one that didn't hold the, uh, the bolt open, which is kind of weird. Have a look at some of the brass first. These are the two max charges that I shot, or two tenths over Vitavori's max, 44.3 grains. The left is our BR4 primer, and the right is our Remington 7.5. Case heads look pretty good, a little bit of uh, bumps and dings. And I do always seem to get some marks on the edge of the rim from the extractor, but they're not nearly as bad as we've seen in the past. And as far as the rest of the brass, shooting suppressed, this, this amount of dirtiness is, is normal. But you can see a couple, couple lines there from the extraction and ejection. These get dragged across that barrel extension. Get a little bit, of, a little bit marked up. But overall, really good. Really happy with this. Case mouths aren't getting dinged up too bad. Looks pretty good. This is the next charge down, their actual... Published max load, pretty much identical. All the brass today look pretty good. Looks like that one's got a little bit of a little extra something going on there. But I'm pretty happy. Like overall, you know, a AR-10 can be pretty rough on brass in the best of times. Now the gun was running really smoothly today. Like the recoil felt low and it felt like our gas system was pretty close. Like I'd mentioned, I kind of ran, ran out of adjustment on the bleed off adjustment of that gas block, but that's okay. You might have seen that I failed to lock the bolt back a couple of times. So a couple more clicks, I think it's gonna be in good shape. It was really like, it was it was throwing brass almost straight back at, at one point. So a couple more uh, clicks to bring that ejection pattern forward just a little bit, and I think this is gonna be pretty darn good. So let's have a quick look at our velocity chart. Not a bunch of difference between the two different primers. The third shot was the biggest gap where they had a 25 feet per second difference between the two. But other than that, they seem to track pretty well. When I look at this, the area I'm liking is between 43.5 and 43.9. Our velocity is right at 2,700 feet per second. We're about a half grain below published max, which always feels good. And also being a half 
half grain below max. Maybe that'll alleviate some of our compressed load stuff, which isn't necessarily something I always want to avoid. You know, it's, it's perfectly good to shoot compressed loads, but they were a pain in the butt to seat on the Arbor Press. They really were. Like, I felt like I was working awfully hard to get them seated completely. And like we saw, you know, I had a couple that were a couple thousandths long that I just couldn't explain or straighten out. So that's not something I'd like to do a lot. You know, seat a bunch of compressed loads with an Arbor Press. Or maybe I should have pulled out the hammer. Give them a seat with the Arbor Press and then just one good whack with a hammer to make sure we got all the way home. I'm half joking, but probably wouldn't hurt anything. You know, and the other thing, maybe we just didn't have quite enough neck tension to hold the bullet in place once we got it down onto that compressed load. Because that's a thing. If you don't have enough neck tension, you seat a bunch of bullets and put them in your ammo box and then come, up, come back a couple hours later and your overall wings can be messed up because that compressed powder charge has pushed the bullet back up a little bit. But back to our chart. Like I had mentioned, that 43.5 to 43.9 range is looking pretty good. Both primers gave us similar velocities and it's kind of a little bit of a plateau there before we jump up there to that 44.1 grain velocities. Now, a couple problems with this chart and reasons why the chart might be lying to us. The first is the brass. The brass was not already fireformed to our gun. So maybe now if we rerun this test with fireform brass, maybe it will look different. And maybe we'll eventually do that. Just run it again and see how they compare. The other problem is that with only one shot, it's hard to feel confident that your average velocity is going to be the same. But in this case, you know, we had shot that group beforehand and got some velocity numbers from it. And it had a 7.4 standard deviation. You know, our 10 test shots had a 7.4 standard deviation. That makes me feel a little bit more confident. So let's say that's somewhere close to what we're generally going to see within 555. Good SD numbers that are usually less than 10, then if we go to the chart and say, okay, we can be pretty confident that these numbers are within 10 of where they would normally be, it gives me a lot more confidence in the accuracy of this chart. If the SD of our 10-shot group had been 27, then we could review this chart with a much larger grain of salt. Then again, so that's an assumption that, you know, this powder is going to have at least acceptable standard deviations all the way across the board, and that may not be the case, right? We've seen some powders where standard deviations are usually pretty consistent across the board, and then other times we'll be shooting a really crappy powder that's given us horrible numbers, and then out of the blue it shoots a good one. So just don't have enough data to be confident at this point. So an assumption is the best we can do. So I think what I'm going to use going forward is the CCI BR4 primer and 43.7 grains. I like that our velocity was right at 2,700 feet per second today. That'll be nice and easy to remember as we mess around with stuff. If we go a little bit longer with our overall length, hopefully we can get away from any of our compressed load weirdness. So that's my plan right now. I'll wait and see what you guys have to say in the comments. But why the BR4 over the Remington 7.5? I wouldn't say it was more impressive in this chart. But if we go over to Shot Marker and look at our groups, here's a look at the, the, the groups we shot with the last five rounds of each primer. So number one here and number two here were 43.5. Three and four were 43.7, which is the, the charge weight I think I'm going to pick. So these last five shots, you can see the BR4 is a 0.52 inch group and the Remington 7.5 is a 1.13 inch group. Does this matter? Probably not. I mean, I think the idea whenever doing these velocity node tests are that you really ignore results on paper for the time being, but it's hard to ignore. You know, here on the left with the BR4, if this, this group, you know, our lowest charge was 43.5 and then the highest was 44.3, that's a pretty good little group for eight tenths of a, of a grain of powder difference, of charge weight difference. So maybe some of these shots that went out of the group with lower charge weights are things we'll avoid by going with the BR4. And it wasn't really bad here, especially in the wind, you know, wind definitely could have pushed some of these, which would be another good reason to devalue this group size information from today's test. I don't know. I think we're off to a good start. One thing I wanted to mention, I forgot to say earlier during talk of load data, the maximum overall length in my barrel with this bullet is 2.865. That's about where it hits the, the rifling. So if we go with a full magazine length of 2.8, we're still going to have plenty of room. We're not, we're not going to be flirting with the lands. And we've got a big range to check. Like I said, you know, right now we're at about 2.677, 2.675. 
and I'd really rather not go shorter. So that's, you know, it's 125 thousandths of possible overall lengths that we really kind of need to explore. And like we'd mentioned, neck tension. So I'm not really sure which way to go next. Neck tension or overall length? I'll see what you guys have to say, put a little bit of more, more thought into it. I'm thinking overall length, but then again, you know, I've only got three bushings. Yeah, I might be able to do both. Maybe I'll do both in the next video. We'll do some quick neck tension tests, then get back to the bench for some, some overall length tweaking. All right, I think that's enough rambling for now. Pretty good little start here. Very happy with how the gun's running. It's not really tearing up brass, and we've got a bullet that looks like it's going to be a good shooter. I went out to see if any of these were available. They're, they're not available anywhere right now. Apparently, there was a big batch that was released this spring. I saw a lot of people talking on forums and stuff about a bunch of different retailers having these in stock in like March or April earlier this year. And they are not cheap. But it's kind of good, right? It makes me... I need to get better at making progress in that first hundred bullets, right? I, I end up with this wandering, meandering load development where we just shoot box after box of bullets and never really nail down final numbers. So we've got 70 of them left. Let's see if we can nail something down for once. All right, that's it for now. See you guys next time.